Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, an inspired conversation space between Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner on the journey of motherhood through the common thread of parenting, relationship and sexuality as a path to consciousness. We keep our conversations honest, our experiences real and our philosophies exploratory. We believe that in order to raise incredible humans, we first have to raise ourselves. We know that in order to rock the family, you've got to nourish the mother. If you are here, you care about paving a path of conscious and intentional motherhood, connected with yourself and your gifts, and also illuminating your children in theirs so we may raise more whole humans who can impact this world in a more humane way. If you desire to integrate your learnings practically and supportively, head on over to bridgetwood.life or julietenner.love to go deeper. And for all live streamed pre-release podcasts and all our free content, head over to our free Facebook group, Nourishing the Mother with Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. We are Julie Tenner and Bridget Wood, and we are so grateful you're here. Welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is When You Dance with Becoming What You've Always Judged. And dot dot, this is the um, continuation of my pro life journey. <laughs> Yeah. Just to give to, some context to that big lofty subject <laughs> yes I was gonna say dot dot and then in my head I had a total mental blank what am I calling it oh yes the hysterectomy journey that's right so even that is funny right because as we have done in this whole podcast we don't ever wait to podcast to the point where it's also perfectly put in place that we have you know a well articulated everything it's like well you know in fact that's a perfect segue into the fact that you didn't say my hysterectomy journey because you're not fully owning that yet you said my prolapse journey yes that's true I actually really love that you pulled that out because I have got to a point of totally owning that which actually feels incredible because I have heard that I I can love this I know this like Yeah. yeah and I actually zero shame so Which cute. is so beautiful, like so beautiful, because I literally can rock around in whatever other spaces and be like, oh, well, you know, I'm going through this prolapse journey at the moment and blah, blah, blah. And every time the women are like, yeah, oh, you know, you can see them be drawn in by that. And it's only because I have no shame and I'm like, it's cool. Here yeah. it is. But, you know, like to the listeners who haven't perhaps heard the first podcast, this has been, you've arrived here after right, a month my, of like, you know, right. they even pressing record on that first podcast there were, you know, you really had to be with the shame around that. hundred percent. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I really, that's why I was saying, I really love that you pulled that out. Cause that was such a beautiful moment to reflect and go, oh yeah, I really have owned that. That's totally different to what it used to be. Mm. And here's the next part that I'm now got a whole new journey to to be with. So, so what do you feel like the space in between owning prolapse and owning choosing to have a hysterectomy? Mm. What does that space exist with right now? Look, it's uncomfortable. I had I was um with my Cairo the other day actually and she said, Oh, okay, so you've decided to have a hysterectomy okay is that like you're fully into that or you're like I'm not sure and I said look I don't know if I would ever be 100% yes this is the 100% the right way to do this journey and I'm not sure that that's the safest place to be mm-hmm. to be so two feet 100% in a camp is that the wisest place to be I'm not sure that it is mm-hmm. because I can choose as I stand here and, and I have slowed this journey way down. Like we, here we are in September and, I mean, this journey has been going on since the start of the year. So I have taken a very long time on this journey. And by virtue of this podcast, I've had access to more stories from women than I think probably the average woman would have. So I have gathered more stories. I have spoken to and listened to more w- women through their different experiences than I think anybody else has. And I have taken an incredibly long time to be with all of my options. And 
I have made sure none of it is fast. Mm -hmm. So I sit here going, and, you know, I've come to the decision where I don't have to have a hysterectomy. I don't. I could have, if I want to have prolapse surgery and I want to have it all pulled up because there's a lifestyle impact now that natural measures haven't been able to help me with. And Mm -hmm. I've really, I've done all of them over the last five years. So you're looking at surgery, whichever way you cut it, pardon the pun but you're looking I'm looking at surgery 100% so the surgery that I'm looking at would involve because I have all three prolapses so it's a multi-organ prolapse would look at cutting the front and the back of the vagina and then how we pull the top up so where the cervix is so you can have it elevated from the womb or you can have a hysterectomy remove the womb and the cervix and have what they call a vaginal vault and have that suspended on on ligaments So there's some research that says with hysterectomy, there's a greater recurrence of prolapse. Mm. Statistically, I have looked into that. I can't find it as particularly definitive. Perhaps there's a small increase. Um, That's one of the questions that I'll be bringing to my surgeon when I see her next week is, is what is her impression in that? But I have, I guess I'm more relying on the data that I've spoken to of so many women with their various experiences. And of those stories, I can't say that there's a significant difference in mm-hmm. reprolapse. What I can see in some of the studies is that when you have a prolapse, you are more inclined to have a recurring prolapse. There's just a weakening right. of the so tissues if, there. If you have a prolapse surgery and not a hysterectomy, you could potentially be needing to repeat that prolapse surgery again. Again, so does the removal of the womb um, increase your chance of reprolapse? Look, I don't think statistically it's definitive and it depends on which which studies you look at as all research does, right? I mean, you could probably find a research to justify any point. So, but I'll be checking that with my surgeon next week. So I'm looking at, okay, so if I have a hysterectomy, do I have an increased likelihood of reprolapse maybe I lose my cervix and as we all know I'm not really ready to give up cervical orgasms so that's been a huge factor for me or I could choose to keep my uterus and keep my menstrual cycle and just have it all suspended higher up but and I have sat with this and sat with this and sat with this I have never been on the pill I've lived my life through my womb like I have literally womb journeyed womb visioned for 25 years and I have a period that's short so I have a period that's every 21 to 24 to 26 days so it's always sat somewhere in there and Mm. I have always I've always fucking my whole life seen natural health practitioners to try and stretch it out to this magical 28 days and it has never like I also have conceived my babies very early so I ovulate on day seven to ten which is also incredibly different to women who ovulate on day 14. So all of my babies have been conceived between day seven and day 10. Yeah. So I have a very short cycle. So 25 years of having a period essentially every three weeks, still seeing a health practitioner to work on my fucking period. I'm actually really fucking done. Mm. I don't, I don't want it anymore. And I actually didn't know that I would ever get to that point. I really didn't know that I would. Mm-hmm. And I have really sat with it. Like, who am I if I no longer have a period? And who am I as can I still be a womb healer if I don't have a womb? Can I still be a healer and a woman's healer if I've chosen chosen to remove parts of my own feminine anatomy? Who, Like, who am I without a womb? Because I've only ever known myself through the lens of a womb and being mm-hmm. womb identified. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really even know myself there. I don't know who I am. And and through through knowing yourself so well from that place, as all humans do, we judge the other. Yeah. Right. So we typically judge the woman who's not women embodied in our perception, right? Like the woman who perhaps wants to skip all of her periods and doesn't even want to think about like, you know, what's this womb? Yes. initiation business right like yes. I'm yes. wondering if there's been times in your oh, 100% oh yeah tell judgy, us about judgy it. over here <laughs> yeah I mean whatever you can damn you breed attract or become right like <laughs> I still that is still one of the um, okay if, if you can't if you can't if you're not watching in our live um 
Facebook group where we share the podcast. There's a little squirm happening in Julie right now. There's a slight squirm, I guess. <laughs> well, because it just, it never ceases to amaze me how I return to this over and over and over. Because, and you never know it when you're doing the condemning or the judging. You never realize it because you're so sure when you're there that it's black and white, right and wrong, the right, right way to live, the wrong way to live. I could never, whatever, like you're so polarized. You can't even contemplate that you could ever be that thing. Right. And yet I have been humbled so many times over my life to literally becoming the thing that I've hated, hated my mum. I become my mum. I've hated on women who have chosen to have a pill and skip all their periods. I'm choosing to remove all of my periods. Mm. I can't even think of others, but I'm sure there's been heaps. It is continuously a universal philosophy that floors me over mm-hmm. and over again. And I see it in my clients. Well, and also how naturally we we swing, right? Like because I was on the pill for 10 years. I never wanted to skip my period because it didn't feel natural, <laughs> which is ridiculous because I was on the pill. <laughs> So good though. <laughs> right, like it took us off me do anything, right? I'm like, you know, this this was, you know, like I got taken, I had irregular periods. So my mom took me to a doctor who told me to go on the pill. And then I was on it till I was 25. Like, this is not an uncommon story. No. But part of my coming to consciousness was railing against that. So I can I've been, I've been that as well. Like I've been like the just, I don't like I've just push it down like and and so I love that we're kind of exploring this here like this this swinging this pendulum it's really uncomfortable like Mm -hmm. this is why I'm saying I'm not resolved as this whole journey has been on this podcast I'm not resolved in any of it but all I can sit here and say is I have slowed this down so much to really get clear on what is an authentic choice not what is a choice based on fear of letting go of an identity or subordinating to a, a philosophy or a set of beliefs that up until this point I've identified with and perhaps may no longer. Yeah. But what is an actual, like, what is, what is my really, what is my gut saying? And I was your womb. <laughs> not not your womb. <laughs> Which is unusual. I actually just feel a whole lot of permission from my womb. Mm. which actually makes me cry yeah yeah like I talk to my womb I've had Mm. conversations with her during this whole experience and I just get this total feeling of peace Mm. like it's okay I've loved her she's loved me yeah We've had some great fucking times together. (laughs) (laughs) We really have. You really met her, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so much. Oh, but gosh, I'm ready to not have to have my period every three weeks and to just be able to have wild audacious sex without having to worry about oh, putting down the towels and cleaning sheets and mm. only having shower sex I'm interested in what it opens up for me mm. that I haven't had before and it, and it, you know I've sat with is this a feminist choice can I still be a feminist and say I don't want to have a female biology mm. you know like all of these judgments, I'm sitting with them or have sat with them. And yet what actually just under that feels really settled in my body is I don't want it anymore. Yeah. Isn't that the the ultimate feminist act is choice? Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm exploring, right, which is not a facet of feminism that I've necessarily explored when it comes to the female body as, you know, perfection. Yeah. Here I am saying, ugh, it's also not perfection (laughs) and I don't want it anymore. (laughs) 
<laughs> like it's different. So, oh, so um, my research now is really on how how uh, it has been on how do I do a hysterectomy in a way that the system doesn't do them because the system just does them one way and where we would look after any type of um, penile or um, male reproductive system pelvic surgery is very, very meticulous around how it handles all of the nerve systems. It's mm-hmm. not in women's pelvises. It's not even a consideration. In fact, even trying to find biological information on what are the nerve systems that supply the cervix and the dorsal nerves that run from the cervix back through, you know, under the pubic bone and round to the cervix, even trying to find that has been really fucking difficult. Because <clears throat> surgeons are oriented to not affecting penile function because they don't want to they don't want to undermine male pleasure. Yes. It's not or part of the conversation. That's not even part of the conversation no. with the female body. No. No. Come to patriarchal medicine. Yeah. So my conversation with my surgeon has been, up until this point in time, has been sexual function focused, which is mm-hmm. extremely different to any conversation she's ever had with any of her patients before. And when I go and see her on Tuesday, it will now be around sexual nerve preservation. What does that look like to preserve nerve function of both the nerves that supply the cervix and the clitoral nerves that run alongside the cervix, all of which can be damaged in a hysterectomy? Yeah. Oh my God. What does that look like? What does it look like instead of going with the stock standard two finger vagina fix? What does it look like to decide what I want my vagina to be? Mm. What size do I want it to be? You really want a bespoke surgery, (laughs) did you? And I admire that. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's all of these questions, right? Yeah. But this is so great, right? Though, because it pushes the envelope on the way the system sees these procedures for women. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I hope certainly. That's feminist. Yeah. Well, it is. Yeah, it is. And the conversation will be, I want to be able to, you know, have a ceremony for my womb and say goodbye to it. Mm -hmm. And I want to write her a letter and I want my surgeon to take a photo of the letter with my womb. Yeah. So I'm looking at, like I would design, an incredible C-section. Yeah. What does it look like to design an incredible hysterectomy? Yeah. And I have to be willing to let go of cervical orgasms as I know them, which when all of my biology comes back up anyway, Will probably change everything anyhow. So well, let me just you know potential to be like <clears throat> different, but but better in the way that at the moment the prolapse is affecting pleasure. Well, yeah, I mean it could be all of it, right? So at the moment prolapse because it loosens and slackens everything and everything kind of flops is the sensitivity of the v- vaginal tissue without I think without concentrated effort or intent that I practice and I build without that. And even with that, the sensitivity is less because there's not as much, there is something to do with tightness and muscle contraction having an uh, effect on pleasure response, right? So when you lose tightness and the ability to contract muscles and, and be in connection with them, you do lose a level of sexual pleasure, with that. So the theory behind the two finger vagina is it creates a tighter vagina and therefore you get back sensitivity. In part, that's true. In part, that would be true. So do I gain sexual sensitivity by everything kind of being put back together a little bit tighter? Maybe, but then I've got scar tissue and I've got nerve damage. So does that cancel that out anyhow? Mm. And, you know, on the TMI level with a prolapse because everything and because I've got a um, multi-prolapse and everything drops a bit. So, I mean, cervical orgasms have just been on a platter for me because the cervix sits so close to the entrance of the vagina 
yeah. you know, the penis rubs it constantly. So cervical orgasms every time, ladies, if you have a cervical mm-hmm. prolapse. So there is benefits here. Not only yeah. that is that because I have a front wall prolapse, the G spot actually sits outside of my vagina. So the prolapse comes out a bit, which also means my G spot is stimulated every time I'm touched with fingers or mm-hmm. with a penis or with a pelvis. Yeah. So I've had incredible G spot orgasms. I've had incredible cervical orgasms by virtue of having a prolapse. Mm. So let's just also mitigate, you know, how in inverted commas unattractive a prolapse is because I've had better orgasms than I had without one. Yeah. And the lifestyle factor, obviously, can't jump, can't run, can't stand for a long period of time. Cocktail parties are my worst nightmare children's parties where there's no chairs, worst nightmare, standing in a queue, worst nightmare, you know, all of this Mm. lifestyle stuff that I'm fucking sick of. Don't want to live like that anymore. Mm. Walking for long periods of time, any of that stuff, pain hurts. You feel like your insides are falling on your outside. Like how can you be present when all you're focused on is the fact that my insides are falling out? Yeah. It's really hard. So I don't want to live like that. I'm in regular, you know, Pilates which is incredible and has definitely made a difference to my back pain, but it hasn't really made a difference to my prolapse. I've done all of that stuff, which we've already talked about. So I want to do surgery. But if even if I didn't have a hysterectomy and we pull everything back up anatomically to where it's supposed to be, my experience of sex will be different anyhow. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter which way I go. There's part of me that has to mourn the change. There is going to be loss where there's gain. Mm. It's going to be equal. As everything gets pulled back up, even if I have a cervix, will I still have cervical orgasms? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Will I still have G-spot orgasms? Probably not in the way that I'm used to having them. I'll have to learn sex all over again, regardless of how this looks. Yeah. Because my body will have changed. Yeah, whatever surgery you have, you're going to need to relearn yes. all of that, whether that's the prolapse or the hysterectomy. Yeah, I I will have to relearn sex all over again and relearn my body all over again and relearn how to reconnect all of those. I mean, if we just even think about it, that that we are neuroplastic and we can create increased sensitivity to any part of our tissues, that I've spent a lifetime sending all of these little nerve endings to my vagina. Like I have to do that again. And then there's part of me that's like, like everyone I speak to is like, well, obviously you can't have cervical orgasms if you remove the cervix. Well, the cervix isn't there, so you can't have cervical orgasms. And yet I've spoken to two women who have had hysterectomies and had their cervix removed who have both said, one said, one was talking to me about the fact that nothing is missing. And I think I said that in one of those podcasts, nothing is missing. Mm. So whatever that was, it just morphs form in my body. So where else is it? I'm like, yeah, fucking A. So I spent a long time thinking about nothing is missing. And the other one said, I haven't spent a concentrated time on it, but she said, I can tell you there is a flavour of cervical orgasm still possible and I can see that if I spent time focused on it, I could get myself there. Mm. We're just jumping in to let you know what is happening in the worlds of Bridgetwood.life and JulieTenner.love in case there's a little opening for you to jump in and expand your life a little bit deeper. So what's happening in your world, Bridge? It's Mother Morphosis, a free three-day series all about identity, your mother line, and your parenting from the lens of the ways in which we are constantly transforming and evolving on this motherhood journey. So I really invite you to join that. We begin on Sunday, the 11th of September. Sign up at Bridgetwood.life. And you, Jules? is Queen School. So Queen School is now a online course with four full modules that you are self-paced and work your way through combined with 12 months of really stretching that out as I help you really integrate, embody and move through the blocks so that you can literally become Queen School in your life. So Queen School is all about connection, pleasure, sensuality, magnetic communication, feminine energy and embodiment with me over and now a beautifully integrated 12-month experience. So you can find out more at julietenner.love. So 
I don't know anyone who's doing this middle path. I know lots of places and spaces and communities that you can go to. Actually, I don't even necessarily with surgery. With surgery, it's very, you know, there is no community. You can't speak to other people. No one shares their stories. It's all very closed all. So there's a surgery, I suppose. And then there's lots of communities for not having surgery and and doing all of the myriad of options that you can do for naturally looking after your prolapse. I don't know someone who's sitting in this space talking about how do we center sexual function? How do you do surgery your way? Mm. I sat and spoke to a woman not so long ago who said to me, oh, well, you know, I mean, my surgeon's just going to decide when he gets in there what needs to be done. I nearly spat my drink out. I was like, I'm sorry, what? Well, you know, I mean, he doesn't really know, so he'll just decide when he gets in there about whether it needs to be taken out or not or, you know, what needs to happen. Wow. Right. And I was like, oh, my fucking God. You know, this is your body. This is your vagina. This is your womb. You get to choose, right? Like, you know, this is yours. Mm. I don't know anyone who's doing surgery your way, who's centering sexual function and who says, let's repair sexual function after hysterectomy tantrically. How is it possible? Yeah. So there's part of me that feels like that divine cord has kind of offered me that thread and gone, this is why you're here. Mm. Like if we think about purpose, I don't know anyone who's lived the life that I've lived, who has the experience that I have, who can potentially do what I can do here. Mm. I don't know anyone else who can do that. That's not to say they don't exist but I don't know anyone. Yeah. So what does it look like to take leadership of all of the women who may follow in my footsteps and say, this is possible and find the pathway because I have the skill set to do it. Even though I'm shit scared, even though part of me would rather not, Mm -hmm. even though I'd wish there was an easier option. Part of me is also excited and fascinated by what might be possible. What don't I know about my body? Because Mm -hmm. over and over again in my lifetime, I have seen all of the ways that the human body defies what science says is possible. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like an exciting frontier of like, what am I about to, it's like discovering a whole nother universe. What am I about to discover that, that, no one's ever known or that I've never known that the, the potential feels and like how can that be a beacon for others I mean how many women have a prolapse and maybe a recommended history to me but a, a, that feels too big but that in fact that might be the better choice for them like do you feel like if you could let go of all of these things in the way that function wise your life would be more useful without the, with like with having a hysterectomy what do you mean in terms of lifestyle yeah like in terms of like function in terms of just potentially not having to have repeat surgery like you know are there lots of women who because of there being no healthy way to process the loss of something so big for a woman Mm. that they choose not to and therefore choose more discomfort and more pain simply because it's what, what I mean maybe there's a lot of judgment right like even in the natural world there's a lot of judgment for women like me who choose surgery same as in the natural birthing world there's a lot of judgment for women who choose Caesar it actually just feels for me very similar yeah yeah versus this can be an empowered choice. This can still be your best choice if it's the Mm -hmm. best and most informed choice for you. Yeah. Does it mean it's the best choice? No. No. But none of those things are true in birth and none of those things are true in something like hysterectomy. It's so nuanced. What is your best choice? What is your best surgery or non-surgical option? What is your best care? 
it's not about any one system. It's about having the freedom to choose what is an empowered choice for you, meaning what is most life aligned and feels right for you, not because you're subordinating to anything or anyone. Mm. So as you all know, I've lived a really like, I mean, essentially I've had versions of this for 16 years. So my tear obviously happened with my first 16 years ago. And in the last five years, it's been more and more significant. And I've gone through all of the pathways that um, I could access and wanted to access. And I'm here going, actually, I would love to use modern medicine to help me out now. Mm. I would love to use both. I would love to use medicine to hopefully give me the best outcome that I can get at the same time as maintaining my own healthcare, my own well-being, continuing on my uh, reformer Pilates, which I, I love and I think is actually fantastic, at the same time as doing my own tantric sexual pelvic healthcare. What does mm-hmm. it look like to do it all together and to take the best of both worlds rather than needing to pick a side? It sounds pretty integrated to me. It's a hard choice to own because it seems I've only told a couple of people no and look, I have decided to have her a hysterectomy and mostly I met with shock. <laughs> you? A hysterectomy? I know. It is shocking. I didn't think I'd end up here either. And yet I can't fucking wait to not bleed again. The ways in which you journey into your body, though, is this not another invitation to more deeply meet and love your body? I hope so. I can see you mapping like all those neural pathways, like because I can see you like having a cervical orgasm by perception. I fucking hope so. This is where you build on everything. Everything's led you to here. Yeah. It does kind of feel a bit like leading a war though, you know, like leaving the safety yeah. of home. Yeah. And being like, this is right or righteous. Mm. I know why I'm doing it. But the courage that's involved. It's never going to feel easeful, right? It's no. going to. And I mean, I, th- I also think nor is it meant to. Nor is right. it meant to. This is my point. Like, what I, if I was sitting here going, yeah, fucking hey, but I've hysterectomy me and everything's going to be perfect. I think there would be something wrong with that. I'm sitting here going, I know it's massive surgery. I know I've got a six to 12 week healing. Hmm. I know I may never have a G spot orgasm again, a cervical orgasm again. My experience of sex may be altered forever. I know that. I may re-prolapse. I know that. Yeah. I'm not sitting here going, this is my saviour. No. I'm sitting here going, this feels like actually a really solid next step for me. It's just hard to to let go of identity Mm. because that's all this is, right? Like that's all these tears are, Mm. is letting go or burying the me that I've been yeah and who you've identified with so strongly for most of your life all of your life yeah recollected life yeah Mm. so it's it's a type of death right which we all go through so many times in in a woman's life I think in particular we go through so many identity sheds Mm. I think some women would go through this when they were you know going through menopause oh yeah well, I mean, I mean, you in some ways you're being asked to process aspects of menopause now. Yes. Really. Yes. That yes. transition. Yes. So I am going to leave my ovaries in. So you do still have a hormone disorder. You don't go into early menopause. And I've heard also from women that have done that, that they still recognize they have a cyclical nature, that they still mm-hmm. hormonally have a cycle. They just don't bleed. Right. 
which is fascinating. Well, for, you that, for you, that sounds kind of lovely, right? So you get to still have well, it's the fascinating the, to me. Yeah. Well, like, you know, attunement to yourself, but without the three weekly bleeds. Yeah. That there's still seasons in my body. Mm. All that's missing is the literal blood. And yet nothing is missing. <laughs> right? Like nothing is missing. So whatever that is, whatever that elimination pathway is, whatever that processing pathway has been for me will just more form Mm -hmm. because there's not one route here that it always has been. The body will find another. Yeah. It will. Yeah. And it gets to be hard. Like it's allowed to be hard right now. Right. It's all of that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly my point. So I'm not sitting here going, fucking resolved. It's all good. Yeah, here's your update. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. Catch us. Just see you on the other side. <laughs> like there's deep processing here. Yeah, this is identity death. Mm-hmm. But because I can see it as that, it's easier to be with because I yeah. know this is me just saying goodbye to younger me yeah. and saying hello to older me. Yeah. And what she's calling you forward to. Yeah. Right? Mm. And that it's feels kind of juicy. Yeah, it does. It kind of feels like when I, you know, do my daughter's new moon ceremonies and one of the things I do in there is share with them all of the things that I've loved from their childhood and all of the things that I'll miss and then all of the things I can't wait to experience in their adulthood. And as they grow, and that's what I'm doing here, but for myself. Yeah. So how can you give that beautiful holding and gentleness and trust that you give to your daughters, to yourself? How can you take yourself through that kind of ceremonial work? Yeah, that's what I want to do. So I want to design my own ceremony. I haven't totally worked that out I was kind of like waiting next week I have the appointment and when I could book in a date then I was going to plan from there but I've also you know I want to be able to do that with my group of friends I mean here you know here's going to be me like the month of celebrating myself and my womb so I'm going to be doing that I'll probably have quiet you know moon ceremonies on my own I've said to my husband I need to have goodbye to my cervix sex (laughs) like we need to ritualize the fucking shit out of this whole thing (laughs) (laughs) he's like okay we can say goodbye to your womb and you know your cervix and I love that that we can have those conversations and I love that I can do that because I think that helps that will help me process yeah and you won't be so long caught afterwards in this in-between place yeah I hope like longing for what was and resistance to what is exactly right? Exactly. That this is a rite of passage. So how do I walk this in a way that doesn't snowball it? Yeah. A hundred percent. So even though I'm sitting here, you know, bawling my eyes out, but this is the first probably proper time I've sat down and spoken to anyone about this. So, you know, lucky listeners. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Um, we do, we do sometimes call it our therapy space. So yeah, we do, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> therapy. <laughs> it was literally because we hit record. We won't even get to do this. But Br- Bridget had asked me, and she's like, do you want to just hit record? And I'm like, yeah, we could do that. This is literally like a cup of tea that we would have. Yeah. Um, is that I just recognize this as an identity death. I recognize this as a rite of passage. You know, this is like another form of matrescence or adolescence or menarche yeah. or marriage or any of the other rites of passage that we would have where we have to let go and and become. And so many of those, because they're not adequately held in our culture, we end up pathologizing ourselves as yes. a byproduct of that. And what, yes. you're saying is, what you're saying is this needs honouring. Yes, I know this is an authentic choice for me. Don't get confused by my tears, meaning I don't want this. I do. Yeah. 
but I'm recognizing it is a part of the transition. Yes, exactly. I'm recognizing that even in this choice, in this what you would call a liminal phase, Bridget, in this suspension between worlds, is my rite of passage where I have the opportunity to to consciously be with what I'm asked to be with. Yeah. That's what this is. This is still a really authentic choice based on me trying everything and doing everything to the nth degree where I know this is my right choice. There's no shell left unturned for me. Mm. I know this is it. But it's a big fucking leap for me to trust because it requires such a huge identity shift. This isn't mm. just an easeful little pebble for me. It's a big motherfucking boulder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... I really want to fucking do this. Like I really want to make a choice that's, that's based on what I perceive to be my best quality of life because I have the best quality of pelvic healthcare that I can get and that I can enhance my sexual function from that place, not diminish it. Mm. But I don't know. There's a lot of power in the strength of, intention like that I hope sometimes I worry that it's pride you know pride comes before the fall I don't I think you're too grounded right now to be proud do you think so part of me is like is your feeling of like I can fucking do this just pride you know Mm. I don't know but I kind of think I can yeah I think you can Thanks. So anyway, that's where I'm at. And, you know, beautifully this year, of, as I have, you know, you and I always continue to evolve our business spaces, but this whole year I really created a business structure in which I got quality of life back. So last year I was crazy fucking busy and didn't feel like I had my life in the right balance for me. So this year that's what I changed. And so for the first time, there's no way I could have done this surgery or given myself the space and the time that I need last year. There's no way I could have done it. It's too busy. Mm-hmm. Whereas this year I have created exactly the right business with exactly the right humans in exactly the right pace that allows me to, to move slowly and create this space in order to do deep healing for potentially an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. So I feel like it's the right time, right space just got to trust yeah create the structure and then leap right yeah yeah so that's Mm -hmm. what I want to do I guess you will all be involved in what that journey looks like as it evolves (laughs) I expect that me being able to get back sexual function and be on that path is is 12 months post-surgery I would imagine Mm. maybe more 12 18 months so I don't think that this is a fast journey either I think this it is in that in that time you're going to no doubt be asking yourself in all of the ways what are the different forms of sex for me mm. right yeah you know what's funny is just then I just went oh, there's another one whatever you condemn you bring a track don't become it's just condemned clitoral orgasms oh. <laughs> what if they're the only ones left for me <laughs> I know, I'm pretty happy with clear orgasm. <laughs> right? But this is like, I was like, oh, there's another one. <laughs> oh, so good. So good. So we will keep you posted. Thanks for being on this journey. I um, I hope and I know that there's many women who in their own quiet little way are interested in watching my journey because they see parts of their own in it. So yeah. I also hope that this speaks to you and gives you permission to be an advocate within your own healthcare system, whichever way that is you choose, and that you find the healthcare providers who can provide the service for you that you're wanting rather than you trying to meld into fitting the way that they work. Yeah, yeah. And I really want to honour your courage and bring your vulnerability here for everybody to be with and support you through. Thanks. How do we connect with you, Bridgie? 
over at bridgetwood.life where you can find out all the things, the main thing being reimagining motherhood, which is a beautiful little space where we explore both the conscious parent but also the whole woman, so where those two things collide. Because where it's not all about them and it's not all about you, it's this beautiful intersection where the magic gets to happen. So you can find out more about that at bridgetwood.life. And you, Jules? At juliettenner.love, it's all things Queen School. So it's Queen School, the course with online facilitation by me in Honey Club. So it's all the deliciousness on how to be loved better by becoming a better lover. And you can find out more at juliettenner.love. We are nourishingmother.com.au, Nourishing Mother Facebook and Instagram. We love your podcast suggestions. So please write into us on the socials or via our own um, emails. And we would love to hear from you about if there's questions you would like answered or things that we can help you with. We would love to be able to do that. Remember to nourish someone to rock the family. And we'll see you next week. We continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. Thank you so much for listening. We literally couldn't do this without you. Please share this podcast with anyone you think it would be medicine for. If you desire to integrate your learnings practically and supportively into your life, then head on over to bridgetwood.life or juliettenner.love to go deeper. And if you feel like giving back a little to this free content, please rate us on iTunes or Facebook, all of which helps the podcast reach more mamas who need this type of tonic for the soul 